Dr. Isom here. I am back with the third part of the lecture on the anatomy and physiology of personality. And this section will focus on brain structures that have been related to personality and personality traits. When we're talking about parts of the brain that have been associated with personality traits, we are definitely talking about what we refer to as the limbic system structures. And the most commonly known of these is probably the amygdala. The amygdala is thought to be the main threat and reward detector of the brain. You'll see it's this little green structure here. Amygdala is the word for almond because they thought it had an almond-like shape. What the amygdala does is alert to anything in our environment that could be potentially rewarding or threatening. So it's important in both positive and negative emotions. And what it does is it links our perceptions of the environment with an emotional meaning. So let's say you ran into a saber-toothed tiger way back in the Savannah Plain. The amygdala would identify that as something threatening and then connect and activate the autonomic nervous system or the fight or flight system to prepare you to defend yourself or to run. So it's been very important in helping us to avoid things that are potentially very dangerous for us and to go towards things that are potentially very rewarding. It's been studied for several different personality traits, one of which is shyness. So those scoring very low in extroversion, we would call them introverts. When they are shown pictures of strangers, what you'll see is much greater activation in their amygdala than those who would score more highly on extroversion. Activity in the amygdala has also been associated with anxiety, with fearfulness, and with sociability. Another limbic system structure, the frontal lobes, and in general the neocortex, has also been associated with personality. And we know that the frontal lobes are very important in something called the executive functions, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But these include understanding of social situations, understanding of social roles and relationships, and also um, emotional self-control and emotional judgment. One of the people that really cued personality psychologists in on this was a guy named Phineas Gage, who I'm sure you've heard about. You'll see a picture of his actual skull here that shows the damage that he sustained. And this is a drawing of the actual trajectory of the tamping iron that went through his head. So what happened with Phineas Gage? He was a very well-respected railroad foreman. He was involved in building the railroads across the United States. And he was a manager of many people. And he was, by all accounts, a great person to work for. He was fair. He was just an all-around nice guy. What he would do is the workers would set up explosives to be able to blast to lay the tracks. And he would come up after they had set the explosive and use this big tamping iron. It's a very heavy, probably 10 pound iron bar that's about an inch wide. And it had a flat end and he would use that flat end to tamp down the explosives to prepare them to blast. After he would do that, then he would flip the iron over and he would drag the other end across the rails. And what he had done then is created this needle sharp point on one end and the flattened end to do the tamping of the explosives on the other. So one day he was packing down the explosives with the flat end and he was leaning over and he must have sparked on the rails or something because what happened is the explosives were ignited, blasting that tamping iron through the bottom of his cheekbone. You can see where it entered here and he lost his left eye and it went out through the top of his skull. So he sustained damage here in the frontal lobes, particularly in the medial or the middle part of the frontal lobes. It said that he was thrown back on the ground and after a couple of minutes though, he said, oh, I'm fine. And he got up and he took some time off, but after a couple of weeks he came back and he seemed to be okay. He was able to communicate. He didn't seem to have lost any IQ or any intelligence. And so he went back to work, but it was clear after a couple of days that he was not himself, he had undergone a very dramatic personality change and he became someone who was impatient and fitful and he didn't do very well managing his employees. He made unwise decisions. So he was one of the ones that really cued psychologists and particularly personality psychologists in on the idea that the frontal lobes are probably really important for several personality dispositions or characteristics. And this has also been confirmed by people who have had damage to the frontal lobes, 
or um, if parts of the frontal lobes had to be removed for seizure disorder. What you see in people who have damage to this part of the brain, the frontal lobes, right? If you look at this diagram, here's the area of the frontal lobes. And of course, Phineas Gage, his medial or middle frontal lobes were damaged. You see this impairment in executive functioning. So difficulty with planning, difficulty with being responsible, difficulty with understanding the consequences of your actions, understanding social interactions and social rules. Another thing that the frontal lobe does is moral judgment and emotional reasoning. Those are things that Phineas Gage had deficits in after his accident. And these are things that are consistent with damage to the frontal lobes. There are some cases where damage to the frontal lobes can result in less anxiety or worrying, um, even greater sociability and assertiveness, but that is not the common result of injury to the frontal lobes. Another line of evidence that has indicated that those parts of the frontal lobes are important in executive functioning and also in emotional uh, processing is the fact that there was a treatment for people who had over-emotionality or psychoticism or um, pathological emotional agitation. There was a therapy, and it was psychosurgery actually, that was invented by a guy named Dr. Antonio Moniz. But Dr. Moniz was a Portuguese neurologist, and he heard a talk one day um, where these researchers were talking about how they had these two monkeys that they did research on, and they were just horrible to work with. They were agitated, and they were angry. And what they ended up doing is they had to remove parts of their frontal lobes, and they became very docile and even a pleasure to work with. This made Dr. Ramones think, well, maybe we can do this for people who are pathologically agitated or who are psychotic. The idea is that maybe there's overactivity in the frontal lobes, and if you can remove some of the frontal lobes, then the effect is that you'll calm the person down. And so he actually won the Nobel Prize for developing what's called the prefrontal lobotomy, where he went in and he actually removed parts of the frontal lobes for some patients who showed mental illness, psychoticism, pathological agitation, and he actually had some very positive results. And that motivated this guy here, Dr. Walter Freeman, because he thought, well, maybe we can do that with patients and maybe we can do it without having to remove the frontal lobes. He developed this procedure called the prefrontal leucotomy, where he would take an ice pick, and you can see he's doing it right here, an ice pick, and then tap it through the orbital of the eye, so the bone right behind the eye, and then insert it, and then just kind of wiggle it back and forth. Um, you can see from this diagram here, this movement of the back and forth would then cut connections between the frontal lobes and other parts of the brain, doing the same thing or a similar thing to the prefrontal lobotomy. And Walter Freeman thought this was a wonderful idea and it would be a way to treat people who had pathological, you know, emotional agitation. And actually, this was something that was, it was a treatment that really was desperately needed, maybe not his particular treatment, but there were lots of patients who would suffer from neurological disorders or mental illness, and there were no drugs. There were no psychotropic drugs at that point. This was in the 30s and 40s. And there were a lot of family members that were desperate because they wanted to do something for their family members to help them feel better, to be able to get them back. But there was nothing at that time other than electroconvulsive shock therapy and institutionalizing, locking the family members up. So Walter Freeman had some success with some patients in which he was able to calm them down or to help them with over-emotional agitation. But the vast majority of the patients he treated using this ice pick lobotomy, many were vegetative afterwards, had to be institutionalized anyway. This all ended in the 1950s with the invention of, or the discovery of the first psychotropic medication. So his procedure was stopped when drugs were discovered. But the reason why this was important is that through lobotomy and through some of the successful leucotomies, they were able to show that emotional reasoning was largely a function of the frontal lobe. Another line of research that has given us ideas about personality traits related to the brain come from a researcher by the name of Antonio Damasio, and he has done quite a bit of research in emotion and the brain. He has one particular book where he talks about his patient by the name of Elliot, and Elliot was a guy in his mid-30s who had a great job and a family, 
Unfortunately, what happened is he developed a tumor in the medial part of his frontal lobes, the middle part of his frontal lobes, similar to where Gage had his injury. And he had to have that tumor operated on and removed. And just like Gage, he seemed to be fine afterwards because he seemed to be just as smart as he was before. He was able to communicate. But when they removed the tumor, they actually had to remove quite a bit of the medial frontal lobe area. And afterwards, he was unable to make any decisions about anything as being better or worse than anything else. So he was unable to make judgments of things possibly being good or bad, which resulted in him not even being able to decide which pin would be a better pin to use or what to order on a menu. He ended up losing his job, his marriage dissolved, and he experienced major difficulties in his life because he was unable to make those judgments that showed researchers and psychologists that part of your brain, the medial frontal lobes, is very important in emotional reasoning and in, in emotional judgment. This led Damasio to come up with this idea of the somatic marker hypothesis that any decisions that we make, any judgments that we make, have to have an emotional component, that somatic component. That's essential to be able to know that you're making a good decision or to be able to make a decision or solve a problem, you have to have that somatic or emotional feeling, which is pretty interesting because 20 years ago, we were all saying you should not make any decision based on your emotion. You should make it all rationally. Now we know that that's really not useful either because you can't make a good decision unless you combine your rational thought processes with that somatic marker or that emotional feeling. We know that that somatic part is essential for good decision making. There's a neurological disorder that's related to this as well, and it's called Kupgras syndrome. And Kupgras happens when you have somebody who has suffered some sort of a trauma, and it could be uh, an aneurysm or a stroke. It could be some sort of a brain trauma, like some sort of an injury-related brain trauma. But what ends up happening with Kupgras is, although the patient seems to be fairly healthy psychologically and mentally, they report that there is somebody in their family, often it's the mother or the spouse or the father, that is an imposter. It looks like the person, acts like the person who they knew, but they're just certain it's not them. And the explanation for this is that there is this connection, this somatic feeling that you have with the people that you love, people in your life that you know, like your mother, for example. And if you damage that connection, then you're still gonna recognize her as your mother. And she may look like your mother and act like your mother, but you're not gonna feel that feeling that you had for her. And so you're going to come to the conclusion that it couldn't really be her, she's an imposter. And so even when we're identifying who are the important people in our lives, we also have to have that emotional or that somatic component that somatic marker to let us know that these are the, indeed the people that are important to us. The bottom line is that both emotion and cognition are important and they're needed for us to function fully. And if you lose the ability to process the emotional or somatic component of somebody or something, you're not able to function fully and make decisions. Another structure that's been related to personality is the anterior cingulate, and it's very important in the experience of emotion, and it's been shown to be related to our ability to control our emotional responses and to control our impulsive behavior or our impulses. And so we know that it also is connected to the frontal lobes because the frontal lobes play a role in that as well. One of the sad cases that provides evidence for our knowing about the importance of the anterior cingulate in stopping us from doing impulsive behaviors comes from a guy named Charles Whitman. He was a sniper in the army. And after he finished his stint with the army, he went to school at the University of Texas at Austin. He kept a journal about how he started having very weird thoughts thoughts that he wanted to murder his wife and murder his mother, and he wanted to go to the top of the university tower where he was at school in Austin and just randomly shoot people. And he wrote in his journal that he realized that this was probably not the right thing to do, but he just wasn't able to stop himself from doing it. And he also included in his journal a request that his brain be examined so that they know what was wrong with him. Well, they were able to do an autopsy on him he did climb to the top of the University of Texas Tower and he did shoot a number of people. They found that there was a tumor that had grown in his brain and it had impinged on one of the circuits between the anterior cingulate and the amygdala. 
the job of the anterior cingulate to stop impulsive behaviors and for the amygdala to be able to identify an impulsive behavior as being very bad or very negative or very threatening or very harmful, I guess is a better way to say it. He just didn't have that ability because the tumor had blocked that circuit. That's another reason why we know that the anterior cingulate is really important for being able to know when it is appropriate to engage in impulsive behaviors and when it isn't. Other research on the anterior cingulate has focused on extroversion and neuroticism in particular. And the main idea that has come from that research is that the anterior cingulate may be this structure, just as the amygdala is the main reward or threat detector of what's going on in a person's environment, the anterior cingulate may be the part of the brain that is sort of monitoring what is expected and what may happen that may be a mismatch to what is expected, what may be completely unexpected. So for people who scored highly in extroversion, they showed them words, positive and negative and neutral words. What they found is that extroverts had much more activation in the anterior cingulate for those words that were positive and neutral. And that may be because extroverts seem to be more tuned to rewards and things that could be potentially more pleasant. Whereas people who scored highly in neuroticism had more activity when there was unexpected stimuli that occurred. For example, in a study where they would show the same picture over and over and over again, and then every once in a while, in a low probability, they would show a completely different picture. When that happened, for people who scored highly in neuroticism, there was much more activity in the anterior cingulate. So one of the conclusions is that the anterior cingulate may be important for detecting a mismatch between what's currently going on, the current state of the world, and something that may happen that is totally unusual. The anterior cingulate may be the part of the brain that identifies that and is activated by things that are different. One of the arguments about looking at different structures in the brain individually is that maybe it's not that useful to study structures in the brain as much as it might be more useful to study systems and circuits because as you maybe remember from me talking about it before, we have anywhere from 85 to 100 billion neurons in the brain and each one of those could be connected up to 10,000 times. So it really does make sense to think about how things might be connected in the brain and how they might function as a system rather than looking at the activity of any one particular structure at a time. An example of this is given by Funder when he talks about researchers who were studying people engaging in a task and they found that there were two groupings of structures in the brain that would work together. There was the C system, C stands for reflective. This was the system that was active when the person was doing effortful thought processing about themselves and about others. And it included these structures, part of the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and part of the temporal and parietal lobes. Whereas when people were just relaxed, when they were not engaging in effortful thinking, they were engaging in effortless or reflexive social thought and this is the X system, there were these completely different structures that were activated. So instead of looking at any one of those particular structures specifically, it made more sense in this case to look at the functioning of those different systems. And it may make more sense to look at systems and circuits in general rather than particular structures in the brain. And this makes sense because if you think about the idea of the neural context effect, there's no one part of the brain that does any specific function or process because every neuron is so connected to other neurons, they have to rely on processing of each other. So it doesn't really make sense to study one area or structure of the brain if you want to understand a complex process like personality or emotional judgment or decision making you need to study a series of structures or circuits or systems because every specific structure functions in the context of its connections with other structures in the brain. This approach of looking at systems is one that Jak Ponksep used. Based on his research with animals, Ponksep identified these seven basic affective systems in the brain that he later hypothesized were the basis of personality, not only for animals, but for humans as well, because our brains share many of the aspects of these seven affective systems.
And in fact, his later research went on to develop a scale to measure the behavior associated with those affective systems. And when he factor analyzed that scale, the affective neuroscience personality scales, with the five factor measures, he found significant relationships between four out of the five factors with those affective systems. Pongsep's research suggests that at least for extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, and openness, a significant part of our personality may be a function of brain structures and brain systems. Unfortunately, Pongsep's contribution to personality has not been well received and you will probably not see his research contributions in many personality textbooks, if any, because there has been a resistance in the field to compare our personalities as human beings to those of animals. However, I suspect his work will gain greater recognition in the future, particularly his idea about the power of play. Pongsep hypothesized that two of the affective systems, the play system and the sadness system, may be opposite sides of the same coin. In other words, to fend off feelings of sadness, activation of the play system may have great potential as being therapeutic against depression. In other words, in order to maintain our mental health, we have to play. Play is essential. The link to this video on Pongsep's power of play is online for you to watch and I highly encourage it. Another example of a researcher who looked at systems and circuits rather than individual parts of the brain is Richard Davidson and his colleagues. He was interested in how EEG and activity measured by EEG differed in different parts of the brain and whether that was related to emotions, the experience of pleasant emotion or the experience of unpleasant emotion. And what he found is the experience of positive emotion was associated with a particular pattern of activity in the brain compared to the experience of unpleasant or negative emotion. He also found that people who are depressed showed that same pattern of unpleasant emotion and people who were non-depressed showed the same pattern as people who were experiencing positive emotion. And he followed up his studies with fMRI and PET studies as well. He studied EEG and if you recall I talked about EEG in the first part of this lecture. The brain wave that is most often studied with the EEG is alpha because alpha indicates that that part of the brain is not really processing, it's, it's relaxed, it's not actively processing. So when you identify alpha in the brain, you know that that part of the brain is sort of resting. When alpha is suppressed, okay, when you see more activity, that beta activity that looks like the person's processing information, then you know that part of the brain is more active. He found people who are experiencing positive affect or pleasant affect, their brain, if you look at the patterns of EEG on the brain, they would show much more alpha suppression on the left frontal hemisphere compared to the right. So alpha suppression means that there's actually more activity in the left frontal hemisphere for those who are experiencing positive or pleasant emotions. For those that are experiencing negative or unpleasant emotions, he found more alpha suppression on the right. Okay, alpha suppression, again, it means that there's more activity going on in that part of the brain. So he found more activity on the right compared to the left. For people who were depressed, he found depressed people showed more activity on the right side, okay, measured by alpha suppression than people who were non-depressed. Non-depressed people showed more activity on the left side than depressed people. He also put people in a mood induction. So they would, he would either have them watch a little short clip of Happy Feet. It's a movie that's kind of uplifting. And what he found is that from before they watched the clip to after, they would show more activity on the left if they saw the happy clip. He also showed a negative clip, so he did a negative unpleasant mood induction and I believe what he showed was Sophie's Choice which is a terrible movie about a mother who has to decide which child she wants to give up and have murdered which I haven't ever watched because it sounds horrifying but after watching a clip of that they were in a more unpleasant or negative mood what do you think he found he found that there was more alpha suppression on the right frontal hemisphere alpha suppression means more activity after being in that negative mood induction. 
So one of the things he thought about why he saw this pattern of results is he thought, well, maybe there's part of our emotional response or our emotional experience that is located in the frontal lobes. And he wanted to know if it was more than just the experience of pleasant and unpleasant and he could extend it more from depressed versus non-depressed people. He wanted to know if people who were very positive and very happy also showed distinctive patterns of brain activity. So he found the Dalai Lama, who you see in this picture here, because he thought he needed to find the person who experiences the least amount of negative affect in the world. And if you follow the Dalai Lama, he has an Instagram and a Facebook. He is very positive and very compassionate. And Davidson reported that he'd never seen anybody with more left frontal alpha suppression, which means more left frontal EEG activity than the Dalai Lama. He also measured people's brain activity across time. So he would measure a person uh, time one, he would measure the same person again and again and again. And what he found was that he would see this same pattern of activity you'd either have more left frontal or more right frontal. And it didn't matter when he measured each person, that same pattern was evident every time. Remember, we would call this aggregation when you measure across more than one occasion. But he found that these patterns of activity that people showed were stable. And so he thought maybe this is a trait. And he called this trait affective style. And he thought you can measure anybody's EEG and identify their affective style. Do they tend to be more of a optimist person who experiences more pleasant affect or do they tend to be more of a pessimistic person who experiences more unpleasant affect and he was able to do studies and show that people who showed more activity on the left frontal tended to experience more pleasant affect over time whereas people who showed more activity on the right frontal tended to experience more negative or unpleasant affect over time and so he thought this was a trait that could be measured and it was your tendency to emotionally or affectively experience the world. This is the way that a person views the world, either very positively or very negatively, and that affects the emotions that they tend to experience most often. He also thought maybe part of this is reflective of something called the approach and the withdrawal systems. And this refers to a theory by a guy named Jeffrey Gray, which I'll talk about next. The approach and withdrawal systems are also related to positive and negative or pleasant and unpleasant affect. The idea is that activity in the left hemisphere reflects the approach system, the system that's involved in approaching rewards and anything that could produce pleasant affect. And the withdrawal system in the right hemisphere is active when a person is experiencing unpleasant affect or negative affect associated with the functioning of that system. Oh, one other thing before I get to Jeffrey Gray is that Davidson is still studying this many years later. He was so impressed by the Dalai Lama's pattern of activity, more left frontal activity and his compassion and his positive affect that he wanted to study how people can gain that type of perspective on the world. And so what he found was that meditation has the ability to do that. Meditation has the ability to impact your affective style. And so that is what he's currently studying right now. Let's talk about Gray's BIS and BAS systems. BIS stands for the behavioral inhibition system and the BAS stands for the behavioral activation system. Gray thought, and he was an animal researcher, Everybody has these two systems in the brain. There's the approach system, there's the withdrawal system. Richard Davidson went a little bit further and said, okay, these systems are probably located in the frontal lobes based on his effective style research. But what are these things? The behavioral activation system is proposed by Gray to be kind of your accelerator, your go, the thing that drives you to go towards things that could be rewarding. So it's your approach behavior. It's the tendency to be attracted by things that could potentially be good for you, okay, or rewarding for you. And to the extent that you have a very active behavioral activation system, it's going to increase your impulsivity, okay, your, your tendency to go for something, even if you don't know if you're going to be successful at it. The other system is the behavioral inhibition system. And he calls this your brakes. So if the behavioral activation is your accelerator to move you towards things, the behavioral inhibition system is your brakes and it keeps you from going towards things that could be potentially punishing 
so this could also be called your withdrawal system. It inhibits your behavior towards things that could potentially hurt you. The activity of this system generates a trait of anxiety. So your behavioral activation system, the part of your brain that is motivating your approach behavior, generates a level of impulsivity in you, whereas the behavioral inhibition system, this is the brakes, the thing that keeps you from doing those things that you shouldn't be doing because you know they're going to be harmful for you, this can generate anxiety. If you have a very active behavioral activation system, then you're going to have more impulsivity if your behavioral activation system is not very active, then your impulsivity level is not going to be very high. Similarly, if you have a very active behavioral inhibition system, you're probably going to have higher levels of anxiety. Whereas if you have a less active behavioral inhibition system, you're going to have less anxiety. The activity and the functioning of these two systems is independent or orthogonal, kind of like the big five traits. You can have high levels of both. You could have low levels of activity in both. You can have one high and the other low and vice versa. To the extent that your behavioral activation system is active, you're gonna be more sensitive to rewards. To the extent that your behavioral inhibition system is more active, you're gonna be more sensitive to punishment. And this is useful, I think, because if you think about what motivates you, you probably are motivated more by either punishments or by rewards. And that probably reflects the activity of these two systems. Some people are very motivated by the threat of a punishment, and some people are very motivated by something being very rewarding. As a parent, I know that with two of my kids, all I, one of them, all I had to do was give her a look, and she stopped doing whatever she was not supposed to be doing. The other one I had to threaten a little bit or yell. The third child, I could yell until I was blue in the face. He would not be sensitive to that at all. But if I offered a reward, if he would stop doing whatever behavior I didn't want him to do, then he was paying attention. We are motivated differently by rewards and punishments to the extent that we have activity in these two systems, according to Gray. So it's an interesting way of thinking about what motivates us. And it also is useful, I think, in thinking about if you're a parent or if you're a teacher, you have to figure out ways to motivate children or other people to comply with your requests. You might identify in that person or try to figure out what's more sensitive, their activation system. So would they be more sensitive to some sort of incentive or is their inhibition system more sensitive? Would a punishment or a threat of losing a privilege, would that be more salient to them? Because we differ in our sensitivities of these two systems. We differ in our sensitivities of these two systems and they are independent. So the sensitivity of one system is unrelated to the sensitivity of the other. Now Gray said, these are the two essential traits of personality. All you really need to think about to describe people is their levels of impulsivity, and that can be measured by how active their behavioral activation system is, and their level of anxiety, which can be measured by looking at how active their behavioral inhibition system is. The last classic theory I want to cover is iSync's theory of personality. iSync, as I mentioned before, was a personality psychologist studying the essential trait approach. And he believed that there were only three essential traits, psychoticism, extroversion, and neuroticism. And that is all you need to be able to describe personality. He also believed that each of those traits had a brain-based cause. The first of these traits, and probably the one that has been most heavily researched, is extroversion. Isink believed that extroversion was a direct result of the sensitivity of what used to be called the Ascending Reticular Activating System, or the ARAS. We refer to it now as the reticular formation. It is the part of the brain that's involved in maintaining arousal levels in the brain so that we can stay focused and alert. The reticular formation is connected to the neocortex, the cerebral cortex, but also the rest of the brain. The role of the reticular formation is regulating the arousal and the alertness of the brain. According to iSync, everybody is trying to achieve and maintain an optimal level of cortical arousal, but we don't all start out with the same level of cortical arousal. People differ in their levels of extroversion and introversion to the extent 
that they are either over aroused or under aroused. He thought that extroverts who have less cortical arousal at any given time at rest, so their brain is generally unaroused, they are starving for arousal essentially, they want to increase their arousal with all kinds of stimulation, talking to people, being in loud environments, doing things that are exciting, even taking illegal drugs or speeding, doing things that are sensation seeking. The reason why extroverts do that, according to iSync, is that they don't have enough arousal in the brain and they're constantly trying to bring that arousal level up by interacting with people and in environments that are more stimulating. Introverts, on the other hand, are naturally more aroused cortically and they spend most of their time trying to decrease their levels of arousal by avoiding loud environments, by avoiding places where there are lots of people and lots of activity and lots of overstimulation, like large parties. For neuroticism, Ising thought that this trait was all about a person's reactivity to emotionally stressful events. He related neuroticism to the limbic system or those structures in the brain that are involved in the fight or flight system. Those who have higher levels of neuroticism, according to iSync, have a lower threshold for activity in the autonomic nervous system or the stress response. What that means is that it takes much less for people who score highly in neuroticism to have that fight or flight response, to have a stress response to a given situation. People with higher levels of neuroticism, they react more easily to emotional situations, to stressful situations, and when they do have an emotional reaction, they react to a greater extreme. They experience the emotional reaction more intensely. Those who score low in neuroticism, on the other hand, have a higher threshold for autonomic nervous system activation. It takes more for them to have a stress response. And when their autonomic nervous system does respond, the intensity of their response is much lower than people who score higher in neuroticism. They just don't respond or react as easily to an emotionally stressful situation as people who score higher in neuroticism. Ising's last trait, psychoticism, he claims to be brain-based but he related this to individuals' levels of testosterone rather than a specific part of the brain. So his argument that this was brain-based is a little bit shakier than the other two traits. And his evidence for why testosterone is important in this trait is also a little shaky. He claimed that criminals have higher levels of testosterone And criminal behavior is the type of behavior that would be consistent with somebody who has high levels of psychoticism. This trait could roughly be defined as the opposite of conscientiousness or the low end of the conscientiousness dimension. So that wraps up this section on brain structures and systems related to personality. The next section will focus on the neurochemistry of personality.